Ted Bundy didn't fit the stereotype of a serial killer. He was handsome, intelligent, charming, and a rising star in Washington state politics. But it was those very things that made his victims, friends, and even law enforcement so unsuspecting of him. Unbeknownst to them, behind the facade, there lay a sadistic monster just waiting to come out. Over a period of four years, Ted Bundy kidnapped, raped, and murdered 30 women across seven states. While there are many speculations as to when and where Bundy killed for the first time, what is known is that by 1974, Bundy had already started targeting young, pretty female college students in Washington state. From Washington, he would leave a trail of victims throughout Oregon, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, and finally Florida. Many of his victims were pretty, young, white women with long, straight brown hair. Quite similar in appearance, to his dream girl, his first girlfriend, Diane Edwards. Bundy's MO generally followed would typically approach his victims while on crutches or with his arm in a sling, asking them for help carrying his books or asking them to help him unload his car. Once he had persuaded the victims to accompany him to his Volkswagen, he would attack them with a crowbar hidden in the car, force them inside, and take them to a pre-selected, secluded location where he would rape and kill them. This location would also serve as his dump site. Bundy did change his MO from time to time. He once pretended to be a police officer when attempting to abduct a woman in Utah. He also attacked some of his victims inside their place of residence. Bundy's reign of terror finally ended when he was caught in Florida in 1978 for driving a stolen vehicle. He had already been charged and convicted in Utah two years prior but he escaped from prison twice while awaiting trial in Colorado. Bundy eventually was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death in 1979. In 1989, he was executed for the murder of two women from Florida State University's Chai Omega sorority. Over 30 years have passed since Ted Bundy's death, but people still continue to ask why he left such a horrible legacy. This was a guy who had a lot of good things going for him. He was highly intelligent with a reported IQ of 136. He made it to the honor roll while he was at the University of Washington studying psychology. He was admitted to law school. He had a promising career waiting for him in law and politics with recommendations from then Washington Governor Daniel J. Evans and Chairman of the Washington State Republican Party, Ross Davis. He volunteered for Republican presidential nominee Nelson Rockefeller. He was even nominated to be the director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee. And he had a loving relationship with Elizabeth Klopfer. So what could have caused him to brutally murder so many strangers? Did something happen to him, causing him to become so cold-blooded and vicious? Was he born this way? Many psychologists and other experts have tried to answer these questions about Ted Bundy, looking for the events in his life that could have triggered this behavior. Join us as we look at the various theories that try to explain what made this man into one of American history's most heinous monsters. There are several theories proposed by experts on why Bundy became a serial killer, why he committed these horrific acts. One of them came from Bundy himself. Bundy stated in one of his interviews that his violent desires came from his addiction to porn. He claimed that he started off normally before his interest became skewed, going for something a bit more graphic, explicit, and grotesque. These desires coupled with his anger, frustration, anxiety, poor self-image, insecurity, and feelings of being wronged and cheated which caused him to think about acting out his fantasies. Bundy also claimed that this feeling inside him grew and grew until something inside him told him to do it. And so he did. He tortured, raped, and murdered young, attractive women in disturbingly brutal ways. Bundy called that something inside of him the entity, which he described as a purely destructive power that grew from within, that felt gratified when he possessed his victims absolutely. 
The question is, is there really an entity? Did Bundy suffer from schizophrenia or dissociative identity disorder? Or was he making it all up? It isn't uncommon for murderers to blame their heinous crimes on an unseen outside force such as the devil or demonic forces. According to Bundy himself, he didn't suffer from any mental illness that could explain the entity inside of him. However, he was diagnosed with manic depression while he was in prison. Moreover, the real-life version of Clarice Starling serial killer expert Dr. Dorothy Lewis thinks that Bundy might have indeed suffered from dissociative identity disorder. She uncovered evidence that supported this theory. A pile of love letters Bundy sent to his wife, Carol Boone, while he was in prison in Florida. Bundy used different names and signatures in the letters, which could indicate that he dissociated or switched to other identities. Using this perspective, she started looking through all the documentation on Bundy and found that the entity could be another indication of his disorder. According to Dr. Lewis, serial killers are not born that way. They are made to murder by a combination of factors such as significant childhood trauma. However, according to Bundy, he had an idyllic childhood. Well, the truth is very much far from it, according to his family, childhood friends and neighbors. Ted Bundy was born in a home for unwed mothers in Burlington, Vermont. His mother, Eleanor Louise Cowell, had intended to leave him there for adoption, but his grandfather insisted that she bring him home. To hide his illegitimacy, Bundy's grandparents put forth the story that he was their son and his mother was his older sister. According to his aunts, mother and others, Bundy's grandfather had a raging temper and could be extremely violent. It is possible that he had physically or psychologically abused Bundy during the first three years of his life. His aunt recalls one instance where she woke up from a nap to find knives surrounding her on the bed and three-year-old Bundy standing beside her smiling. Dr. Lewis states that this type of action is typical only in seriously traumatized children. When Bundy was four, his mother took him with her and moved to Tacoma, Washington. This time, his mother changed his last name to Nelson in order to hide his illegitimacy. While there, Louise met and married an army hospital cook, Johnny Bundy. Johnny adopted her son, giving him the last name that would become infamous in American history decades later. Bundy didn't have a good relationship with his stepfather. He looked down on his stepfather because of his intellect and the fact that he didn't make much money. Bundy's relationship with his mother was much better. However, she later had four more children with Johnny, which divided her attention. Bundy claimed that he felt unloved, though he was physically cared for. It wasn't clear when exactly Bundy discovered the truth of his parentage. What we do know is that Bundy resented his mother for hiding the truth from him and leaving him to discover the truth on his own. According to one girlfriend, Bundy felt humiliated. Bundy's prison psychologist, Dr. Al Carlyle, believes that this discovery might have contributed to Bundy's violent tendencies. In addition to this, there are accounts of Bundy being teased by his peers for a speech impediment. Some neighbors and friends state that he never fit in. Bundy described himself as a loner, someone who didn't know how to develop friendships. He said that he wouldn't join social activities. Instead, he would go out at night and spy on women. However, some of his high school classmates say otherwise, claiming that Bundy was well-known and well-liked. While we cannot be certain about some parts of his childhood, we do know that he already exhibited some strange and violent tendencies. Moreover, he was arrested at least twice during high school for burglary and motor vehicle theft. So he was already committing petty crimes well before he started his murder spree. While Dr. Lewis may believe that Bundy had dissociative identity disorder, some experts think otherwise. According to forensic psychologist and FBI consultant Daryl Turner, Bundy was a cunning and manipulative psychopath. Bundy exhibited many of the personality traits typically found in people with antisocial personality disorder. He lacked empathy and remorse. 
he was narcissistic and manipulative. He displayed an outward charm and charisma that didn't show insight into his genuine personality, and he was willing to be extremely brutal to others. Turner believes that Bundy already showed signs of his psychopathic personality when he was still a child, and it was this type of personality, combined with his deviant sexual interests, that made Bundy into a serial killer. As for what drove Bundy to kill, he believes that it was the power and thrill of getting away with murder. And some psychologists agree. They believe that Bundy was a power control serial killer. Someone who wanted to dominate his victims, even in death. Raping the women had nothing to do with lust. He just wanted to be in control of them. He could do anything to them and they wouldn't be able to fight back. And killing them was the final expression of his power and control over them. Some speculate that his relationship with his first girlfriend, Diane Edwards, could have been a factor that spurred his killing spree. According to Anne Rule, Bundy's colleague at a suicide hotline and friend, he described Diane as his dream girl. She was from the upper class with a great family, money, and a nice car. But being with her made Bundy feel insecure. He felt that she was out of his league. He also felt that he couldn't take her out to places that she expected to go. Diane eventually broke up with Bundy because she felt that he lacked ambition. According to Bundy, he felt a desire to get some sort of revenge on her. Many psychologists think that his killings may have been triggered by the end of their relationship since many of his victims physically resembled Diane Edwards. And there might be some truth in this. After their breakup, Bundy started working hard on his studies. After graduation, he worked as part of Governor Daniel J. Evans's re-election campaign. He also became the assistant of the chairman of the Washington State Republican Party, Ross Davis. He got accepted in the University of Puget Sound Law School. In the summer of 1973, Bundy rekindled his romance with Diane, who was amazed at his transformation. They were together for several months and even discussed marriage. But in January 1974, he suddenly broke off all contact with Diane, who was still living in California. He didn't return any of her phone calls and letters. When she was finally able to reach him, he just told her that their relationship had come to an end. He never contacted her again. Bundy later explained that he just wanted to see if he could marry her. Diane, on the other hand, felt that Bundy deliberately made her fall in love with him just so that he can reject her in the same way that she did him years before. Coincidentally or not, their breakup happened around the same time that Bundy started murdering women. In January 1974, 18-year-old Karen Sparks was raped and brutally beaten in her basement apartment. She is widely believed to be his first victim. Ultimately, we can never really know which straw broke the camel's back. It could very well be the combination of his traumatic childhood, his resentment towards his mother, the absence of his biological father, his first breakup, and his addiction to violent porn that caused him to become a serial killer. Then again, many others have experienced the same, but they didn't become a sadistic monster like Bundy. While environment may have played a huge part in shaping who he was, it definitely can't be the only reason for it. Maybe it was just who he was meant to be. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.